declares that you dwell in light unapproachable. We do not wonder that Wesley said, veiled in flesh the Godhead see. We thank you, you dimmed your glory and couched it all in the flesh of a little infant child. God contracted to a span, incomprehensibly made man. So Lord, we thank you that because of that we have boldness. Not arrogance, not familiarity, but we have boldness to come to the throne of grace to find help. And Lord, we need help. Our need is so great individually. We need of vision, we need of faith, we need of love, we need of courage. We need of compassion for a broken, lost, damned world around us. A world without God and without hope. Lord, we know every human system is bankrupt. We've tried them over and over and over again. We think of Hitler who is going to change the world and Stalin who is going to change the world and Mussolini is going to change it. And yet all their empires are in ashes tonight. But Lord, we bless you for the risen Christ at the right hand of the Father, living to make intercession for us tonight. And we come, Lord, conscious of all our infirmities, our inferiority, our weakness. But we thank you that you do not make this or that demand on us except that we come, believing in the finished work of Jesus. We thank you tonight, Father, for all the progress that has been made today in your kingdom. And Lord, as we think of this crowd of heroes in Hebrews 11, think of the different kinds and think that even today in this world, I believe this very day, people have been martyred for Jesus Christ in Russia, in China, in other countries. Nobody will ever mark their graves. But Lord, the sparrows don't fall to the ground for what you see them. You see that weary woman somewhere up the Amazon tonight, tired, afflicted, tortured maybe with bugs and all kinds of things. Bad food, bad environment, everything's bad except the peace that's in her heart. And for that blessed mystery fellow that again has gone to some people who have never yet heard the message of redeeming love. We thank you again that old hymn says, Dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. Then in the nobler, sweeter song we'll sing thy power to save when these poor lisping ransomed tongues shout victory o'er the grave. Lord, we ask you for every ambassador of the cross tonight. We thank you, Lord, as you look from heaven, you can see them, whether in Russia or Mesopotamia or Bulgaria or Estonia or some other countries. We bless you. I thank you for the word that we hear about Romania where young people have been stirred. Thank you for the news from Africa there, from Kenya, this week of the, the Mesa tribe being visited by the Spirit where people are walking 20, 30, 40 miles a night to hear the wonderful story of redeeming love that you've opened the heavens upon them they don't get bored, they don't go to sleep while the message is there the atmosphere is electric with the risen Christ of God Lord we pray come to the valley of the shadow of death in which we live come to us with all our religiosity in America all our programs, all our schemes all our devices, but Lord, our clouds have no rain. Our sky has no power. Our word is so empty, ritualistic, so formalistic, so neat. Lord, we pray soon you burst the wineskins. Lord, rip them apart. Let us see the glory our fathers saw. Lord, as we read afresh this story of the Zuzu Street of your workings, and how the roots of that revival went back to the Welsh revival. Lord, we want to see this again in this needy hour. Lord, we're convinced there are more lost people in the world at this moment than ever in history. Dear God, we pray for our young people. They've never seen the glory of God. They sit through a service and answer some little questions sometimes, but they've never gone out of the sanctuary staggering under the revelation of God staggering under the majesty of God, awed by the splendor of God. Lord, we pray, return prophetic ministry to those who profess your name. Lord, we put signs outside of our churches and they've got nothing to do with what's inside. Where is the power? Where is the Pentecost of glory? Where is the revelation? Where is the prophetic word? Where are fetters broken just as though we could hear them snap? 
Where are the drunkards coming? Where are women dragging their husbands to the sanctuary to get them not just sobered but saved? Where are people losing their meanness and their bitterness and their selfishness and their pride and their covetousness and their childishness? Lord, we can't truthfully sing like a mighty army moves the church of God. It's not true. But our hearts ache to see it. We want to see a people, Lord, who want to die, literally to everything. Every creature comfort, every honor the world has, every style, every system, so totally hungry, hungry for God, so captivated with God. Lord, you've told us in your word in the last days, your son and your daughter shall prophesy. Young men see vision, old men dream dreams. And on my servants and handmaids, you didn't say on the bosses and on the millionaires and on the bishops and archbishops, on my servants. We think of how you took servants, Lord Jesus, in the days of your flesh, men that smelled of fish, and I'm making out income taxes, and you took them, and you taught them, and you allowed the Holy Spirit of God to come on them, and they went out and turned the world upside down. Lord, as I read today, there are supposed to be 36 million people around the world filled with the Holy Ghost, and yet only 120 turned the nation upside down. And before very long, people said, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. God, God, heal us of our impotence. Heal us of our blindness. Heal us of our coldness. Lord, put a craving hunger for your presence more than anything we've ever craved for in our lives. Maybe some of these men once craved for honors as sportsmen and that's gone. Pray for success in business and know it doesn't satisfy. Lord, we ask you to get us from the very soles of our feet to the crowns of our head vibrating with God, with the love of God and the power of God and the grace of God. <coughs> we thank you again for your holy word. This lamp for our feet and this light for our path. Bless it to us tonight. May it quicken us. For the psalmist said, quicken me according to thy word. Do this now, Lord. As we open this book, open our hearts, open our understanding. And let this faith we've spoken of kindled in us tonight. Lord, I think of Wesley's cry so, 200 years ago, and you did it. When he cried, give me the faith which can remove and sink the mountain to a plain. Give me that childlike praying love which longs to build thy house again. Thy love let it my heart or power and all my simple soul devour. Enlarge, inflame and fill my heart with boundless charity divine. So shall I all my strength exert and love them with a zeal like thine and turn them to a pardoning God and quench their brands in Jesus' blood. Not again I pray, intensify this desire in my heart. My dear Martha, all the other precious folk here, don't let this section of... of uh, of Texas, point a finger of scorn in the last day and say you were so busy running meetings and other things, you never saw the glory of God, you never precipitated that glory on us. Forbid it, God. Take supreme control. We want to hear. Not only hear, hearken and obey and do the will of God because your word says he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Yes. Give you thanks in Jesus' name. Okay, we're going to look in the epistle of Paul. Well, I think he wrote the epistle. Some people don't. Anyhow, the epistle of Paul to the Hebrews. You know, it doesn't matter what page you open in the Bible, there's contention about it. One guy says this, the other says the very opposite. This is called the epistle to the Hebrews, but that's the title somebody put on it. One man shatters that whole thing because he says there's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free. The church is divided into Gentiles and Jews and other people. We're all one in Christ. There's only one cross. There's only one fountain filled with blood. There's only one purpose for all of us. We come to that a bit later. Hebrews 11. The general idea about this epistle is, of course, it's a, a commentary, a commentary 
on the first five books in the Bible plus the uh, book, of, book of Psalms, which again is five books. There are five books of Psalms in the Hebrew. And, uh, but I don't think it's just uh, an interpretation of the tabernacle and the sacrifice and everything. The supreme work of the Holy Spirit in, the, in this chapter is to make Jesus Christ central. He shows Christ as the beginning and the ending, the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last, the center, the circumference, the light, the life. He's everything. We've been mentioning that book to you that uh, you can get one from Brother... Uh, I don't think he's any in his pocket. It's a big book with 700 pages. It was written in 1591. I wonder how many books that are written today will last 400 years. Most of mine don't last 400 days. I put them in the garbage. Except my own, but anyhow. 400 years. 1591. Isaac Ambrose wrote, wrote on three words. 700 pages. Looking unto Jesus. Hebrews 12. That's what it's all about. And again, I remind you. You know, 95... 95% of evangelical preaching this coming Sunday from Pentecostals to, to who? Presbyterians or Mennonites to Methodists. 95% of the preaching will be about a man who lived 2,000 years ago. After that, the 95, about 3% will be about the Christ who's coming soon. Do you know what we do? We're missing where he is now. He's at the right hand of the Father. Where did he be store upon us? More than you could ever dream of. But we're preaching a prophetic Christ. We're preaching a historic Christ. We're not preaching the Christ where he is now. Living to make intercession for us. Doesn't matter how imperfect your praying is or mine tonight. He'll perfect it. If it depends on our vocabularies, we're sunk. I remember I was preaching once in a church I passed in England. And suddenly it dawned on me. Is the destiny, the eternal destiny of these people dependent on how I put words together, illustrations, bits of scripture? Does it depend on me? Of course not. There is a human responsibility. God has ordained preaching. But we're not going to manipulate people. If, if I can manipulate you one way, this guy will manipulate that way. It's the guidance of the Spirit of the living God. <coughs> Oh, so let's look at here, Hebrews 11 and verse 1. You know, right, right through the whole of the New Testament, I haven't counted them, there are over 300 references to faith in the New Testament. Only twice in the Old Testament is faith mentioned. Look, look that up. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Some say that's a definition, some say it isn't. Faith is substance. What is substance? It's sub. What sub mean? Under. A submarine goes under the marine, under the water. A subway goes under the road. Sub stands. What stands mean? Stand. So substance means under. Stand. You say then it means to understand. No, it means to stand under. It means that whatever we believe God for, faith can take hold of these precious promises and put them underneath. If we can't, we've no claim. We claim on the merits of Jesus Christ. We claim because of his holy word. Over and over again you find this wonderful chapter, faith by faith by faith by faith. We're going to take a character, hopefully, every Friday night now. But you know, it's not only what faith does that's visible. Some of the most amazing things are not even mentioned in this chapter. I remember, you'll think I'm getting old, okay. Sixty years ago I remember reading a book by Dr. J. H. Jowett in England. And he called, uh, <coughs> he calls Hebrews 11 the Westminster Abbey of the Scriptures. Remember they're all Old Testament characters in Hebrews 11, no New Testament. Hebrews 11, why did he say that? It's like Westminster Abbey. Because Westminster Abbey we bury all the famous people. There's a, a disc on the wall with two profiles, one lit behind the other. Somebody called them the two most famous brothers that ever lived, John Wesley and Charles Wesley. You go to another place, there's a place that marks the place of... Well, right up by the high altar there, 
Of all the people in the world, who's buried there? Who's buried there? David Livingstone. When they brought his body from Africa, they cut his heart out by his request. Take my body into England if you like. My heart is here and it's going to stay here. But there's a perpetual memorial there. And all through the Abbey, Westminster Abbey, there are marvellous records of heroes and outstanding people. Some are statesmen, some are lawyers, some are poets, some are preachers. I remember about 20 odd years ago, I, I mentioned Hebrews 11 and uh, Westminster Abbey linked it as I've done just now. A lady came to me after it, she said, Mr. Ramia, we've got the most famous visitors in America arrived yesterday from England. I said, well, who in the world were they? She said, the Beatles. I said, the what? She said, the Beatles. She said, don't you think they should be buried in Westminster Abbey? I said, yes, today. <laughs> <coughs> Why bury those guys in Westminster Abbey? Hmm. You know, this, this, this chapter could bowl us over, except when you realize all these people like us, flesh and blood, they'd nerves, they'd fears, they'd doubts, they'd emotions, and yet somehow God Almighty got control of them. These guys are somewhere up there. You know, God's never behind anybody. We talk about football stars and movie stars and all the rest. Our dear Lord, the apostle wrote about that 2,000 years ago. Not about movie star. He said one star differs from another star in glory. Do you think that John Wesley is going to be the same as the dying thief? The dying thief got that on the last beat of his heart. John Wesley was saved at 35. Turn that round, it's 53. Add them together, it makes 88. That's when he died. We were reading it yesterday, my dear Martha and I. He left, what, six, six silver spoons. Of course, he's a good preacher. He had a good collection of books. Uh, a faded Geneva gown six silver spoons, six one-pound notes, all worth five dollars each. Don't give me a great funeral. Find six poor men. Let them be pallbearers and give them a, a pound each for carrying me to my grave. So he has six silver spoons, six pound notes, uh, a small collection of books, uh, a, uh, a Geneva gown he preached in and uh, something else. What was that? Oh, I remember. I knew there was something else. The Methodist Church. <laughs> Would you believe that's all he left? Do you know he, he, he rode uh, over a quarter of a million miles over the uh, roads in England when they were infested with highwaymen? He rode in the night, he sat on his horse, and if it was moonlight like it is tonight, he'd be reading a Greek primer or a Greek New Testament jogging along on the horse. You know, one night some guys jumped out of the hedge with white coats on and screamed at the top of the, and the horse reared up so John got over it stood in the stirrups and looked over me and said, Who are you? And one guy had practiced this. He said in a deep voice, We're the devil's brothers. Oh, well, he said, Stand on one side and let me ride on. I married his sister. <coughs> Wasn't that rough going? How in the world did he do all his writing and all everything he did? Because one day he became totally committed to Jesus Christ. The message of justification by faith had been lost in the dark ages. How did it come to light? Martin Luther. God reached down into the middle of the Roman church and found the man who defied the devilish system. And they still hate him. After that, John Wesley came and he revived the teaching of sanctification by faith. He didn't invent it, he taught it. In other words, we're to be holy. As it says in the 12th chapter of this epistle, as he which has called you is holy, it says in First Peter, but it says in, in, uh, in this chapter here that, that God has called us to holiness. We are frightened of that word. In one of his hymns, Charles Wesley says, to perfect health restore my soul, to perfect holiness and love. And that's what holiness is. It's not some fantastic thing. It's perfect spiritual health, spiritual clarity of vision. Spiritual strength, spiritual understanding. Yet, this chapter would shock me. These guys are so far up there. One star different, there's Abraham, there's Isaac, there's somebody else. But you know, sometimes you have to turn a thing around to find out the value of it. When I was in England, I used to think sometimes, well, I remember, I did think sometimes, 
But I remember mother calling me one day. She said, this is the third time I've called you. You get curled up in that chair. I haven't been in that chair for two hours. I was up in Minnesota with, uh, what do you call him, Mini, along the shores of Minnie Tonka with Hiawatha and uh, his girlfriend, Minnie Haha. I wasn't in that chair, man, I was miles away. I used to get lost by like that. <coughs> but again, when I think of all these different people, the investment, you know, nobody ever had a bigger Bible than you have, forget it. The staggering thing about Hebrews 11, it, it knocks me out every day I read it. I mean that, God's my witness. I read through Hebrews 11, these staggering men and women, through faith, subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained the promises, stopped the mouths of life. Women received their dead, raised to life again. All the devilish things, and not one of them ever had a Bible. Well, in God's name, what are you and I going to do when we stand before him? If the world lasts another thousand years, it won't last another thousand weeks, I think. But when I get there, I have to face up to having the whole revelation of God. Finney didn't have a bigger Bible than I have. Wesley didn't have a bigger Bible than I have. Spurgeon didn't have one. But somehow they got nearer to the heart of God. They got a revelation from God. They got convictions by the Spirit and they laid their lives on the line. Yes, I can read these heroes of faith. But when I come to this chapter, what's it say? Time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak and so forth. Then it says they subdued kingdoms and wrought righteousness and obtained promises. They had trials of cruel mockings and scourgings. And some did what? When the gate was open, they said no. They refused to be delivered that they might obtain a greater re a resurrection. What do you make of that bunch? There's no name. 10,000 tribulations they went through. I persuade myself that every day I live now, somebody dies for Jesus Christ in Russia or China or somewhere. We go about our business. Of course, we have our hardships. Sometimes you get a, you know, you go to McDonald's and you don't get a very good hamburger and that's a grief, of course. And sometimes you get a flat tire. That's terrible, beyond bearing almost. And yet others are in prison, tormented, suffering beyond anything we can understand, even in this hour. Well, going back, let me say this. When I was in England, I determined if ever I came to America, I was going up the most wonderful place to see something. That was up the, what do you call it, the, in London, the, in, I mean in New York, the uh, Empire State Building. Good night, I went up and down those streets for over three years and never got up there. People go and they say, nobody knows how many millions of photographs have been taken. You know, when you get up there, anyhow, if you stand here, it sways like that, you know, it has to sway, otherwise it would snap off. People are there with cameras, they take a north view, a south view, east view, west view. Oh, there's, there's, what, Stratton Island? Here's the Statue of Liberty, get all the pictures. Everybody's there with cameras. One day a guy got an idea, there might be something better than that. Do you know what he did? He got a camera and laid on his back at the door, and he took a picture from the ground upward. I saw a picture of that, it was very fascinating. It looks as though the top it stops in heaven, you know, when you see the size of the thing. What is it, a hundred stories high, a hundred and ten or something? From the top to the looking down is one thing. Laying back and looking up is something entirely different. Well, if you look at this chapter one way, you'll be staggered. And maybe you'll be uh, knocked back a bit. You'll say, well, that's out of my reach. Well, I remind you again, there were mortals like us. But supposing instead of getting heroes of faith, supposing you turn it round. Oh, well, you've told us what Mr. Jowett said. Well, let me tell you what Leonard Rainhill says in case you ever hear him. He's a bit crazy, but he'll tell you. You know, I say this. I say he Hebrews 11 is a rogues gallery. A dirty bunch. I wouldn't have put them in if I'd written it. You think I'd have put Moses in? He murdered somebody. You think I would have put Rahab? She was a harlot. You think I'd put Noah in, he got drunk. Look at the bunch. Boy, it's like I'm a bunch of deacons. <laughs> All the problems you have with them. And yet God got each one of them in his own place, in his own way. And they all had one common denominator. 
Let me tell you how value this thing called S-A-I-T-H is. As children in England, we used to say F, F, F-A-I-T-H. Forsaking all, I take him. Very good. Good definition. Forsaking all, I take him. How precious the other know it is. Jesus is going down the co around the corner and he bumps into Peter and Peter backs off. He says, well, Lord, how are you today? Fine. He said, I've got a word for you. So people come up to you. I've got people come up to me. I tremble sometimes to get such weird words about me. I don't want to hear them. If they're nice, I do, but not the, not the other things they say. So he says, what? Well, Satan hath desired thee. What else? That I may what? Sift thee. Go on, say the rest. As wheat, that I have. That your health won't fail. No, I, I prayed for you to prosper. Huh? I prayed for you to be successful. Jesus fastened on to one thing. Peter, from here to eternity, you're going to go through hell sometime. I prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. Never mind your money. Never mind your circumstances. My faith looks up to thee. What do you find the apostle saying? Look in the epistle, uh, first epistle of Paul to the Thessalonians. Let's see what he says there. First epistle of Paul to the Thessalonians, okay, chapter 1. Now let me switch that over and, and go to the second epistle for a moment. Because I'll be working backwards if I don't. Second Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 2 that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. Now know this, all men have not faith. I've heard the greatest preachers in America in the last ten years say, come on now, you've got faith, use it. The scripture says all men have not faith. Well, who's right? Your preacher or what the Lord says? No, you... There's a natural faith, of course, in natural things. You get in a plane... You don't check the seat, you just sit on it. How do you know it won't let you down? A pilot, oh, they don't do it now. They used to come in in the old days and walk through and say, Good morning, sir. Good morning, madam. They don't do that. They go in the front now, so you won't see them. If there's any trouble, you can't identify them. <laughs> <coughs> but they used to walk through, and I see this one and say, Excuse me a minute, are you the pilot? Oh, yes, look at my... Oh, I don't care about those wings. You can buy those. I want to see your pilot's license. Oh, it's in my valise. Well, I'm not flying till they show me the pilot's license. Show me the license. I say, has this plane been checked? Yes. Well, I want to see the certificate. Have you got gas in it? Yes. How do you know? I saw a man on the wing there putting gas in it. He used to do that. I remember when he used to watch through the window and they'd gas the thing up. I'm sure he didn't put enough. We're going to New York. How long are we flying? Five hours. He didn't put enough to get us halfway there. What did he do? Stop and walk out? Oh, it's okay. And then of all things, we're going north and the plane goes south for about ten minutes. And you pull the bell and say, hey, this guy's going wrong. Turn left and let's go up that way. You trust him. You don't know he's a pilot. He looks like your garbage collector. <laughs> but you trust him even as, if he is a pilot. You don't know him. You don't look at his license. You don't look at the license of the plane. You trust, you trust, you trust. Natural man in natural things. We're not talking about that. We're talking about something entirely different. Look in Paul's letter to the Romans a minute. <coughs> Take the chapter we all like so much. Romans 12. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Let's go down to verse 3. For I say, through the grace of God given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man a what? A measure of faith. I don't believe every man has the same measure of faith. 
that faith is a gift of God. There's natural faith in natural things. But natural faith doesn't operate in supernatural things. Faith is a gift of God according to the measure of faith. Look at verse 6. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given unto us by the prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. So you see, this is very clearly set forth. You know, some people set off, God has told me to do this, and six months after the whole shebang has closed down. I can give you a whole list of ministries across the nation that start, God has told us to do this, God has told us to do that. You go up to a certain city, there's a, uh, well, Otto Roberts built a tower, so this other guy has to have one. It's half built, it's been there the last 20 years, and they call it his folly. But they had a revelation from God to build a prayer tower. Well, it's good to build a prayer tower. But not if you get people's money by the millions of dollars and then leave it abandoned. There are so many of these things like that. We talk about seed faith. I don't find it in the Word of God. It's likened them to a great grain of mustard. The smallest and become, can become the greatest. Well, let's go back now to Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter 3 <clears throat> But now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of what? Your faith and charity. Now they got both. They had faith and they had love. Now go down to verse 10 in the same chapter. Now this, is the amount, this man has such extreme language, hasn't he? Wasn't it in the ninth of Romans where he uses one of the most awesome things I've ever read in the Word of God? He says to his brethren, linking it to that verse we sang a few minutes ago, my zeal inspire. What does he say in Romans there? He says, I could wish myself accursed. Literally, it means I'll be damned if need be. I'll be destroyed. If destruct, destroying what I have will bring others into the kingdom, destroy me. This man has no half measures. Spinoza talked about a God-intoxicated man. Do you know what? The church never does anything when it's sober. Only when it's drunk. A drunk man doesn't care a hill of beans what you think about him. I told you, the first day of war, 1939, I was at the head church of the Nazarene in Scotland. We came out of the meeting. The whole city was in darkness. Street cars had no light. Automobiles had no light. The brother I was with said, Brother Radio, I'm going in a building here. But you had to carry a gas mask. It was given in a, in a box with a tape. You put it around your neck, carry it on your shoulder. Compulsory to carry a gas mask. Instead, there was a raid. He went in that room, and I stood by a lamppost. And he said, stand by that lamppost, so when I come out, I'll, I'll be able to find you in the back. So I stood there. A streetcar came up. A Scotsman got off. His rubber legs wouldn't hold him up. And he pitched forward and put his arms around the lamppost and me as well. I was thinner than I am now, not too heavy now. And he sa I said, hey, he said, hey, hey, what's your name? I told him, ah, you're English, ah, I had no time for you, he said. And he said, I'm Sandy McTavish, can you sing? I said, no, I can. And he sang, Maxwell Town Brazer Bonnie, started singing. Rolled his feet, can you fight? I said, oh, no, no, I can't fight for sure. You can't sing, you can't fight? Put his hand in his pocket and brought a handful of silver now, when a Scotsman hands you a handful of silver, you know he's drunk. <laughs> He'd never do that if he was sober. Ah, he said, I want to talk with you. I said, I can't stand talk. You can't talk, you can't fight, you can't sing. Ah, you're no good, he said. If I'd met that man at nine o'clock in the morning instead of nine o'clock at night, he wouldn't have even given me the, the morning. He wouldn't have said top of the morning to me. But he's intoxicated. And it's only when men and women are really intoxicated with the love of God and the will of God that they're reckless to do anything. I don't believe faith is believing something you can't prove. Faith is having the grace to do the thing God has told you and it looks as black as hell. It's a reckless abandonment to the known will of God. And right through the scriptures you'll find how that goes. Well, let's go back again then as we said to Thessalonians. I'm praying night and day. That is First Thessalonians chapter 3. Praying night and day. He isn't satisfied to say, you know, every morning after breakfast, I kneel down and say a little prayer, oh, bless those dear people at Thessalonica. He says, I pray by night and pray by day. And I pray earnestly. I pray with a sweat. 
I pray with an anxiety for you. For what? It's already said previously in verse 4, that uh, verse 6, they have faith and charity. What does it say here in verse 10? Night and day praying exceedingly that we may see your face and su- might supply, might make, might, sorry, might make perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Now go to the second epistle for a moment. Second epistle of Thessalonians. This chapter 1. What is he praying for in that verse we just left? Praying night and day that I may see your face and supply that which is lacking in your faith. Now look what it says in verse 3 of the second epistle, chapter 1. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because your faith groweth exceedingly. Notice, not your faith groweth. Your faith is growing by leaps and bounds. Faith that is going to be trusted is going to be tested. I used to say often to young people, you know, I say, look at my muscles. My muscles are hard to find. I never chop trees down. I'm never athletic. I haven't used my muscles so that they're not developed. I was uh, in Miami airport one day, rushing downstairs. I think the children had arrived and I was rushing. And here's the what do you call it, escalator thing coming up. And just as I went, I saw this big black head coming. And I stood back. Hi. It was Muhammad Ali. I wasn't going to get in his way for sure. Boy, what muscles he had. Boy, did he strut his stuff. Boy, everybody in the airport was... Ooh, 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 ooh. I went past the old went... <laughs> You know, very opposite, that worm of a guy. Faith that's going to be trusted is going to be tested. Can you think of the excitement of a man who spent so much time in prison? Discouragement? God help you. He had a band of spirit-filled men. What did they do? They abandoned him. Demas half forsaken me, having loved this present world. Alexander's gone off to something else. Spirit-filled men deserted a spirit-filled man. Deserted the most monumental, holy character the world's ever seen outside of Jesus Christ. And then you wonder why you get upset. Something gives you the cold shoulder. Forgets you, ignores you. Well, at the opposite. Not only is he discouraged when all men... But look what he says. All men forsook me. Nevertheless, what? The Lord stood by me. You say, I'm not getting me- very near to God. You know why? You have too many friends, that's why. They take your time up. Come and sit in your house. Waste your time. Get rid of half of them. I'll leave you to choose the half. <laughs> husband get rid of his wife's friends. Wife get rid of her husband's friends. That's that a, bit of a bit of a clearance, wouldn't it? But he says, all men forsook me. And you know what happened? What happens when you take the scaffolding away? You see the building. Most of us have had theological scaffolding around our thinking all our days. We've never seen his glory, never seen his majesty, never seen his broken heart. Therefore, we're not broken. We think we're here just to glide along and, you know, help me in the hour of temptation. Brother, sister, if you're not known in hell, you're not much good. I tell the preachers that every time I get a chance to preach to preachers, so uh, they never send me any thanks. But if preachers are not known in hell, they're known in God. Paul was known. What did the demons say when they kicked a a fellow around? They said, listen, Jesus we know and Paul we know. Can you think of anything more holy, more wonderful in our own creation? That somebody says, you and Jesus Christ are the same? The demons said, we know when Paul moved, we knew when Jesus moved. Jesus we know and Paul we know. But who are you? You usurper. Dear God, I'm trying to write a book and the chapter I'm writing some things about preachers. I think they'll have the book publicly burned. I hope they do. It'll sell better. (laughs) Hey, when all the facade is taken away, when everything that we cover ourselves with, you know, our ability, our scholarship, our ordination, everything, when it's all taken away, and I appear naked in the sight of God. That's going to be some mighty revelation. But Paul not only was 
didn't get discouraged when the other officer took him and fled. But on the other hand, he says here, your faith groweth exceedingly. And the charity of every one of you that he mentioned previously in the first epistle, chapter 3 and verse 6, but he wants them to be, have a boundless charity, a boundless love. Don't you think he swung to the extreme? If he didn't get discouraged when all forsook him and fled, he must have been awfully encouraged when these people were going on in leaps and bounds with revelation and with love and with faith. And that's what it's all about. Our maturing in holy character. I, I think the next three will give you some of these Oh. I don't know what I have them now. I had an outline. Are you going to run some off for us? I had one. Okay. I just let me make a reference to it. Thank you. We'll give you one of these next week. We won't take an offering either. Isn't that amazing? Well, it's just, it, it's all tabulated out of Hebrews. I think it's, it's very wonderful. I didn't do it. I mean, I copied it, but I didn't invent it. You know, God wants us to bring us into a glory that we don't know a thing about. Was it Isaac, Isaac Watts wrote the hymn, Jesus shall reign, where'er the sun doth its successive journeys run? His kingdom stretched from shore to shore till moon shall wax and wane no more. Blessings abound where'er he reigns. The prisoner leaps to lose his chains. The weary find eternal rest and all the sons of want are blessed. Blessings abound where'er he, where'er he reigns. The prisoner leaps to lose his chains. Then another son says, In him, in Christ, the tribes of Adam boast more blessings than their fathers lost. Do you wonder that one of the old saints, a century or more ago, said about the epistle to the Hebrews, it's the hub of the wheel. All the epistles are joined by this mighty central factor. It's showing the supremacy of Jesus. It tells about Jesus in the beginning. But let's, this is what it brings us into, if we follow on to know the Lord. He says in Hebrews 2.14, we are partakers of flesh and blood. Hebrews 3.1, we're partakers of the heavenly calling. Hebrews 3.14, we're partakers of Christ. Hebrews 6.4, partakers of the Holy Ghost. Hebrews 10.33, that we're partakers with the martyrs. Hebrews 12.8, partakers of chastisement. 12, uh, Hebrews 12.10, partakers of his holiness. Because he had no sin. Well, you need, a, you need a little bit of sin to keep you humble. Why not, have a, why not have a lot and be real humble? I never saw a sinful man that wasn't arrogant. There isn't one sin you can defend. There isn't one sin will enrich your life, your character, your personality. They're all destructive. The devil comes not but to destroy and to kill, to rob us, to keep us in bondage. all be in tears. Say, dear God, did I walk so near to spiritual riches? So near to spiritual wealth? So near to spiritual authority? So near to spiritual power? I was preoccupied with something. Oh, there was a sale at pennies that day, so I forgot about my bike, but I rushed down there. I did something else. You know, I pray for you daily, and myself, we'll be more eternity conscious. Let the other people go after chaff. Dear God, most Christians live for trivia. Won't stand up five minutes. Let me quote this one thing, then I'll finish here, or I'll go on talking too much. Anyhow, we get some of these for next week. We'll, you can all have one free as a Christmas gift. <coughs> when I first came to America... <coughs> I came first in 1950, and for eight years I commuted the Atlantic. I went across it about 20 times. But Sunday nights I'd dash home to the hotel, 
and there was a little box on the wall, a little thing like that, just two stations, you know, in those days. No national TV, no TVs, they haven't come, no radio. You switched a button, you got on one channel or the other. I used to switch to this certain channel. There was a church up on the west coast of the United States in Portland, I forgot my name. And the preacher there would say, well, we've just returned from Africa. Thousands gathered every night, thousands were saved, thousands were filled with the Holy Ghost. Okay. We had a great service here last Sunday night. We had to put chairs in the aisles. We had over 2,000 people. Ten people came forward to be saved. Twenty came forward for the baptism. Eight came for, forward for healing. It was a wonderful meeting. Boy, that used to make my hair stand up. I'd like to be in one of those services. That fellow went on like that. I had one of the most powerful ministries on radio in America. Just a year before he died, he was very sick. His wife came in as usual at night, gave him a good night kiss, brought some milk for him and left it there. <coughs> when he went in in the morning, he said, Darling, call my pastors, call the deacons. I want them to stand round the bed. Well, he'd made a lot of prophecies, so she thought he was going to prophesy, I'll die, you know, at 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon or something. He said, Dearie, when you left last night, Jesus came and stood there right at the bottom of the bed. And he pointed to me and he said, I know your works. For 25 years you've been in this church. You've seen signs and wonders and miracles. You've been to Africa and taken photographs of crowds. You've had a great ministry. I have something to say to you. Your 25 years of ministry is wood and hay and stubble. Your life and mine is either wood, hay and stubble or silver, gold and precious stone. Wood, hay and stubble are above the ground. That's the ministry people see. Silver, gold and precious stone is secret ministry. Praying, weeping, travelling, doing works for God that nobody knows a thing about. And that this man... He said, Jesus said, your life for 25 years of wood, hay and stubble, as God is my witness, I believe I'll stand at the judgment seat and see that Christ with eyes of a flame of fire and listen, everybody's frozen tongue will melt before him. I believe I'll see the bakers, what do you call them, Jimmy, Jimmy, Tommy, Tommy, poor souls. They spent 25 years building a ministry of wood, hay and stubble when the, because it's all above ground, it caught the eye, it got rewarded. And it's going to go like that. It's going to burn like that. Going back to this man, he said, Darling, Jesus himself appeared and said to me, Your life, your healing ministry, evangelistic ministry, is wood and hay and stubble. When I put my torch to it, you'll just be knee-deep in ashes. And he said, I want all the preachers to come. They came in and he told them what happened. And he said, You know, I've been pleading since I woke this morning, Dear God, let me live just one year as I should have lived all my life. I don't care about the obvious ministry. Give me birth pangs. Give me the secret, secrets of the Most High God. You can't publish them. I want to lay up for another year. No more wood, hay and stubble. Silver, gold and precious stones. Silver is a type of redemption. Gold is a, is a type of devotion and worship. Precious stone. The priest had a breastplate like this, about this side, a bit wider. He had 12 precious stones. There was a name of the tribe on each stone. And he went into where? He went into the Holy of Holies where nobody else could go. You know, I want you dear people, and I want to, I want to go to the Holy of Holies. In the outer court there was daylight. In the holy place there was a seven-branch candlestick. There was artificial light. In the Holy of Holies there was no light. No light. It was as black as black could be. Unless the Shekinah glory of God came. When that Shekinah came, it was brighter than a thousand sunrises. You see, this is the trouble with our generation. Dear God, why do you go to the church you go to? Oh, we have the best choir in town. Oh, no, we have the best young people meeting. Oh, we have the best this. Tell me where is the glory? As I asked the dear brother, precious brother flew in a plane, little plane, all the way from Oklahoma to come to this meeting tonight. He's coming back next Friday night, God bless him. I asked him, I said, brother, when did you last tip to out of the sanctuary? You couldn't whisper to your wife. 
You couldn't say a word to any. You're overwhelmed. The heavens parted. You saw the glory of God. The Shekinah great came. If it came once, we'd never forget that if we lived to be a thousand years old. But it's only for the holy man to go into the holy place. The junior priest couldn't go there. I, I reminded you before that, that statement that Dr. Criswell makes that uh, in the what, second book of Chronicles, chapter 26, you remember there's a, there's a uh, what was the, the name of the priest there? Uzziah. Uzziah. And he came through the outer court. He came through the Gentile court. He came through the women's court. He came through the priest's court. He came to the holy place. Then he went to the holy of holies. That man must have been demon possessed. Why? Because 81 men tried to stop him and he tossed off 81 men. He was determined that he would go and do what the priest could do and God said you won't and he struck him dead. They put a leopard's rag on his lip. But I use that, I say, well listen, he said, let me tell you this first, uh, just go back for a second. That man, uh, Julius Caesar's rival, what was he called? Pompey. Pompey became more powerful than Caesar, so Caesar sent him to what was called the Holy Land. When he arrived, they went in ships, they had horses with, you know, with the, uh, what do you call them? Curtains on them, or whatever you call them, and beautiful saddles, and the men had plumes in their helmets and breastplates, and the people gasped, they'd never seen people like this. When they marched through town, they said, what's that building? Oh, that's, that's the temple. What's that for? For God. What? We have a hundred, a thousand gods over in Rome. No, this is the God. He put that ball of fire in the sky. He puts the stars in the sky. He controls the universe. He made the universe. And that God comes in there. Yes, he does. So Pompey comes and outside people remembered when they heard the news. Pompey has said he is going to the Holy of Holies. 2,000 people followed him and screamed, don't go in, you'll die. Don't go in, you'll die. He was determined to go in. They remember that second, chap that second book of Chronicles, chapter 26, where again uh, Uzziah went in, he defied the priest, he went in, and the glory of God struck him. Well, I quote it, I say now, that man came all that way, look how far he came, through the Mediterranean Ocean, and, and then into what we call Israel. Then he goes through the outer court, the women's court, the Gentile court, the priest court, to the holy, holy place until it gets to the Holy... Young people come to our churches. I went to a church not long ago. They've got 30 acres. Why? We want our old football field, our own tennis course. Dear God, the children go to church to learn to play tennis? God help the preachers. Why can't them get them spiritual so they want prayer and revelation and the word of the living God? So I say the young people come to church now. They go past the basketball court. They go past the tennis courts. They go back to the base, past the base, baseball court. They get inside the church. But there's no glory. As I said to a man today, we go to the house of God, we read the word of God, we sing about God, but where is God? How do you, often do you go home, you can't eat your dinner. You felt the impact of eternity. I'd rather have ten people that want God than ten thousand people that just want to run a church. I could go and join a church now, be a, a co-pastor with 12,000 members. And the guy will build me a mansion. Oh, ah, that doesn't interest me, it's a hill of beans. I want to see the glory of God come. So that our young people don't have to be told to go. They just long to get to the sanctuary where God is. The glory of God fills the temple. It's going to take that. In this critical hour in which we are living, preaching isn't going to do it. Big crusades aren't going to do it. It must be the very presence of the living God there. Until we're broken and humiliated and groaning and so broken over a rotten world that there's no contentment for us except to see the glory and majesty of God. Okay, let's, I better sign off here. Well, anyhow, that measure of faith you have, it's got to be exercised if it's going to grow. I thought twice about that hymn that came to me as I was praying. Charles Wesley, give me the faith which can remove and sink the mountain to a plain. 
give me that childlike praying love which longs to build thy house. He's not talking about a, a gorgeous building. Building God's house. A place where God is comfortable. A place where from center to circumference it's God, God, God. The will of God, the purpose of God, the revelation of God. I want that faith to be developed in me. And the only way it can develop is by testing. You go into the next chapter, what does it say? It says that the, the Lord will develop us how? Not by giving us creature comforts. We're going to be tested in the areas of patience. Two difficult things. One difficult thing is to find the will of God. There's only one thing more difficult, that's doing it. Ye, ye have need of patience, it says in the 10th chapter, to do the will of God. What was the will of God for Noah? How much patience did he need? Over a hundred years of it. But God didn't tell Abraham to build an ark. They all had their different appointments. We'll see they needed faith to worship. Abel, there's, there's faith to worship. There's faith to work. There's faith to witness. And yet God takes us, as it were, in a side room and says, Look, I'll show you how I made these men. They didn't sit down and somebody have a blackboard and teach them. They were taught by the Spirit of the living God. They had no pocket Bibles. Come on, do you, do you and I know God so intimately? And even if you're driving down the road, the Lord can say, pull off and get up a side lane. I want to speak to you right now. I used to have a good memory. I don't know. I'd wake up in the night. Something would come to me. I'd say it three times. And when I go up in the morning, I'd say it like that. Boy, I can't do that now. As soon as anything comes, boy, I'm up and out of bed. Martha comes. How long have you been in your office? Darling, I've only been here a couple of hours. I didn't trust myself. Is God going to be my secretary? Is he coming, if I won't listen the first time, is he going to come the second time? I'm his servant, he's not my servant. He gives orders, I can't give him any orders. He's here to command this little span of life I have, dear God, how short it is. When I see what these men did. Bob, you call me this week? I, I want to see you after me, just one minute, that's all. Uh, Brother uh, Jack here has a book it's the history of the Azusa Street Revival I hope you'll all get it do you know why? because the revival 1904 in Wales Evan Roberts was corresponding with a man in California and the fire in California began in Wales a man in Wales caught the blaze he went from there to the Cyclop Hills in India and they had revival he went from there to China, they had revival. They said, we're going to Korea. And the Chinese said, you'll never do anything in Korea, they're so phlegmatic. He had a bigger revival in Korea than he had in China. So he went back to China, and he came back again. But you know, the background of it all was praying. I preached, preached one day down in uh, Lake Oka, Okaboji. Okeechobee is in Florida. Okaboji is in I know a bit of Indian history anyhow. It's in Iowa. And a young lady came to me and she said, uh, No, there's another one. It's a man that came to me this time. And he said, Did you ever meet Praying Hyde? I said, No, no I wish I had. Did you? He said, Yes. At the Cyclop Hills in India. He said he preached. And he said, I said to him, Sir, could I see you in the morning, even for ten minutes? He said, well, yes, I'll be praying in a back room in the morning. Come at 10 o'clock. And he said, I went and I knelt at the side of him. He was kind of soft, speaking softly. And he said, uh, he stopped. So I, I, me, you know, big prayer warrior, I poured out my heart, you know, told God everything I knew in five minutes and shut up. <laughs> he said, he started praying. And I looked at my watch. And he said when he started it was 10 o'clock. He said he hadn't prayed many minutes, it was... And he said, I said, oh no, 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 I'm not going to... The, I'm, I'm, I'll never get the chance to come back, I'm not going to do it. Second time, third time. I'm not going. Somebody put their head round the door and said, <coughs> Brother Hyde, you're speaking at 3 o'clock. And it's 15 minutes of 3. 
And he said, I said to myself, the man's an idiot. We haven't been here half an hour. But he said, he started praying at 10 till 11 to 12 to 1 to 2 to 3, 5 hours. And it went like that. He said, it was awesome. I wouldn't go to that. I didn't even open my eyes. He said, it wasn't the volume necessary. He talked as though he was kind of whispering to God, talking to God at the side of him. But every revival there's been, has been laid in prayer. You can't have birth without travail, you can't have birth without pain. We try to do it by crusades, bring in a special speaker, forget it. I got an invitation today to go preach to hundreds of preachers. I said, no, not as far as I know I won't. If the Lord tells me, I'll come. Because preachers are the key. Those preachers need to get broken. Forget numbers, forget the money, forget all the other showmanship. Are we robbing hell? Is the devil afraid of us? I'm not going to sing on what Christian soldiers do. I feel there's a unity, even here. A passion for the lost, a burden. It's getting terribly late. I had a letter, just, well, it's stingy. I had a postcard yesterday from one of the greatest preachers in America. Dear Leonard, he said that the coming of the Lord is near, then in capital letters put very, very near. It's now the moment to be alerted in a new way to storm the stronghold of the devil. Numbers don't matter. Money doesn't matter. What matters is we all get a new quickening. We all get a new revelation. A new, a new priority. I've never in my life been so awed. If I can take one second. I told somebody yesterday, you know, a few, remember a few months ago, the press said that a boy had been living in a bubble for a number of years, and at last they'd taken him out of the bubble. I'd been living in a bubble for about six months. A bubble of the fear of God, not cringing fear. His awesomeness, his majesty, the failure of the church. Come on, I'll go out on a limb. Why in God's name? I've got to be honest somewhere. Tell me where's the Pentecostal church I'll go. A church where you can open those doors and say, this is that. A church where you know you can't take a person twice before they'll get saved. It'll tell you about that in the Azusa Street meeting. A dear brother that, that came down today, Larry there, asked me about the awesome presence of God. In, in the great revivals in England, those little Pentecostal guys, they had no money, they had no advertising, they had no hype, they had no begging. And yet when they walked in the meeting and sat down, big strong men started to weep. Eternity came on them without opening their mouths. We have to whip up an excitement with a choir or something and all kinds of junk. Well, I'm tired of all that. I believe God is going to manifest His power. I think the big boys have had their day. They've gone off now, off, off TV. There's a chance for local churches to take over where those guys, not where they left off, but to show something better. And there is a praying remnant in this area. There's a praying remnant in this country. And I thank God for them. People who don't want the surface, people who are the silver, gold and precious stones under the ground, not showmanship on TV, I've led so many millions to Christ, I've done this, that's baloney. When the fire gets to it, it'll be chaff. We need to live with eternity's values in view. Faith to believe what we can't see, but we know. God manifested even for our simple flesh and blood. I hear there's going to be a, a rally or something tonight for young people. Did you hear about that? Where is it? In Lindell. After a ball game or something. Oh, it's after 11 o'clock. They should be going to bed at that time, not going to a meeting. Anyhow, somebody's going to witness to them. Uh, my neighbor, what's his name? Forgotten his name? <laughs> Jacob. He's preaching at Rose Heights Sunday morning and Sunday night. Dave Wilkinson opens his church in Times Square this weekend. I don't know where Joe Fort is. He'll be troubling the devil somewhere, I hope. Let's believe God for them. Doesn't matter who gets the glory. If God gets the glory, I don't care a hill of beans. I'm sick of guys posting how much they've done and what they've done. Forget it. There's an awful lot of flesh got to be burned up before God's glory is coming down, I'll tell you that. 
Aren't we simple? We're like little children. A little girl boasts her dollies better than yours. This boy's bicycle is better than yours. Their dogs are bigger than yours. You know, the Christians are very much in that silly game. Let's tell God we've got an ache in our hearts to see his glory. To go to church, dear Lord, some mornings at 10 o'clock, come home at 10 at night. That's what they do in revival. They don't run out for a coke and a, and a this and a that and the other. God holds them spellbound. When God is on a meeting, people don't go home when, they, when, they, uh, when the preacher says, well, good night, God bless you. They didn't leave the sanctuary. They didn't step out of God's holy presence. We need to walk like that every day of our lives in close communion with him. With a consciousness, we're right in his will. You say, my faith doesn't grow much. I'll give you the answer very simply. Faith groweth how? Cometh by theology. No, that's the reverse version. Faith cometh by... Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Let's pray for Spencer. He's still up there with the Indians. Pray for his wife. The baby hasn't come yet. Pray for these other meetings. I believe it's going to get harder and harder to be a true Christian. The church is getting more worldly and more fleshly. Let's sing a verse and if you have to leave, leave. I hope you can stay for a little while anyhow. <laughs>